All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce one of my trusted colleagues at Northwestern, Dr. Alex Kikosh. Uh, Dr. Kikosh is Associate Professor of Medicine at Northwestern and serves as the director of our EP lab. He also has carved out a clinical interest as well as research niche within the field of cardiac sarco sarcoidosis and actually runs uh, the sarcoid registry at Northwestern. So he is going to speak to us this morning about arrhythmias in cardiac sarcoidosis. Thanks so much, Alex. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Nishan. Uh, okay, so I have a lot of slides, so uh, I'll start. Uh, I'll be talking about arrhythmias in cardiac sarcoidosis from an EP perspective. So as you know, sarcoidosis is an inflammatory disease, and we have uh, uh, different stages of inflammation. We have an early stage of lymphocytic myocarditis. Uh, we have a granulomatous uh, phase, uh, which is an intermediate stage of inflammation. Uh, these granulomas are non-necrotizing or non-caseating as uh, opposed to tuberculosis. Uh, and then we have a late stage where uh, the myocytes and other tissue that has been destroyed by inflammation is replaced by uh, scar. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of cardiac sarcoidosis. First, as we talk, you have inflammation, which can be acute, chronic, can be low grade or high grade. The active inflammation leads to myocyte loss and repair fibrosis, and then you have scar. So the substrate for arrhythmia in cardiac sarcoidosis is complex. Uh, it's dynamic because it changes, it waxes and wanes, uh, flares up, and um, reactivations frequently go undetected. They're silent clinically until they cause arrhythmias or congestive heart failure or uh, other cardiac symptoms. Their location, uh, it's a patchy substrate. It's not like you see in a, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy with well-defined myocardial infarction. It can be mesocardial, epicardial, or endocardial. The border zone is an irregular uh, zone, and it's heterogeneous. Uh, to further complicate the substrate, you have Purkinje fibers that may be entrapped at the edge of scar or in inflammation. It can be an arrhythmia for themselves. Many studies we have uh, about arrhythmias in cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, are somewhat old, and I think we are making the diagnosis earlier these days, and the substrate is likely changing, and the patient population is changing. So we have less patients with end-stage scar, uh, and more patients with uh, acute sarcoidosis and actively inflamed substrate. This is a, a pathology picture to show you what sarcoidosis can look like. In figure A, you see dense, uh, infiltrate, scar, uh, probably with granulomas at the borders. In figure B, you see a diffuse pattern where uh, you see strands here in figure C in large, you see strands of fibrosis interspersed with some probably viable myocytes. And uh, in this picture at the right, you see that it can be very patchy. Uh, you have uh, anteroceptal infiltrates, which are quite characteristic and oftentimes associated with AV conduction problems. And you have patchy infiltrates in the septum, epicardial, uh, mesocardial, and so forth. This is a figure uh, that I uh, designed for a patient lecture. Uh, why is heart involvement dangerous in sarcoidosis? And what can happen? Well, you can have sarcoidosis infiltrates in the myocardium, in the ventricular myocardium, uh, leading to damage to heart muscle and weak hearts. Then you can have uh, interruption of the conduction system leading to heart block uh, and loss of the heart rhythm. And then you can have a uh, focal infiltrate that represents a uh, substrate for reentry leading to ventricular tachycardia and cardiac arrest. And that only shows the ventricles, in fact, because obviously you can have infiltration in the atria as well. Most important first step is to make the diagnosis. And who makes the diagnosis? Well, I'm gonna show you how we can 
make the diagnosis uh, from a general cardiology perspective, from an electrophysiologist perspective. And then remember, this is a multidisciplinary um, disease. Uh, sarcoidosis is a systemic disease. So you have pay, uh, a lot of cases that are diagnosed by pulmonologists, traumatologists, ophthalmologists, ENT, GI, liver, dermatology, etc. So this is a 34, uh, an example of a case, 34-year-old athletic male with new exertional dyspnea. So uh, I don't know if anyone wants to activate the microphone and uh, say what they see. Uh, I'm going to give you five seconds to look at it. Well, it's okay. Uh, uh, there is prolongation of the PR interval, and it's uh, 370 milliseconds. And this patient presents to a general cardiologist. Everyone will notice that the PR interval is this prolonged, and it's markedly abnormal for a 34-year-old. So there is no doubt that uh, further investigations are indicated. Uh, because he has exertional dyspnea, he was sent for a stress test, treadmill stress test. And this is what happens uh, during um, his treadmill. Uh, you see uh, he's exercising, heart rate here is about 110, and then all of a sudden it drops to, I'll help you, it's about half. And you see a P wave before each QRS, but if you look carefully, there are P waves, uh, there is two to one block. There are P waves on the T waves here, uh, which is markedly abnormal. And this patient on cardiac MRI had uh, delayed enhancement uh, in the septum, in the interoceptum, but also in the anteroceptum, which explained his AV conduction, uh, AV conduction abnormality. So it's important to think about how to screen patients uh, uh, who to screen uh, for sarcoidosis? When should we think about sarcoidosis in a patient that doesn't have any history of sarcoidosis uh, anywhere else? Say you have patients that are relatively young and the age cutoff, it's obviously unclear. Uh, I would say younger than 65 that present with unexplained high degree block, uh, Mobitz type two or third degree. Um, Say you have patients that present with unexplained ventricular tachycardia, unless it's a clear um, benign variety of ventricular tachycardia, such as outflow tract VP, fascicular uh, VP, or known ischemic heart disease. If you have a patient presented with concomitant cardiomyopathy and heart block, now there are other genetic cardiomyopathies that can present like this, but sarcoidosis definitely is something we should think about. If a patient presents with ventricular arrhythmia and heart block, we should also think about why does the patient have these, both of these manifestations. A patient presenting, uh, presenting with cardiomyopathy, ventricular arrhythmia, or heart block in the presence of hilar or mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Obviously, any other organ system involvement, but I, I think uh, hilar lymphadenopathy is something that we easily look for. Patients have had chest x rays. Many patients have CAT scans. I oftentimes just uh, open up uh, their CAT scans or chest x-rays and see, oh, there's high load lymphadenopathy. We should really look into this further. And patients with unexplained myocardial infiltrate from cardiac MRI obtain for other reasons. We should always think of sarcoidosis as a possibility. So let me give you another exam example here. Uh, this is a 36-year-old male with exertional palpitations. So, we see that during the treadmill test, uh, exercise stage three, he has PVCs. These PVCs look pretty narrow, they're right bundle superior axis. Um, so because they're right bundle superior axis, we think, well, they're coming from the left ventricle, post inferior wall. Uh, this could be fascicular PVCs. It could, it could be a variety, of, a variety of benign PVC. Um, and here, he has a brief run of ventricular tachycardia also during exercise. This is a 36 year old, highly active. We could discount this as a benign fascicular uh, VT. Now, this pattern that he has of monomorphic ventricular tachycardia coming in bursts 
uh, you know, you could call it repetitive monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. However, it doesn't match uh, what we uh, categorize as the uh, benign variety of repetitive monomorphic DP because those are outflow tract ventricular tachycardia. So this behavior is somewhat uh, different. It, it's somewhat not expected necessarily for this type of morphology. Now, in addition to that, uh, just wanted to show you that, in fact, he also has Q waves inferiorly, which are narrow but quite big. So there is some suspicion there. Uh, and here, yeah, so I'm pointing out the PVCs, the Q waves, and uh, he does have uh, on cardiac MRI delayed enhancement in the inferior wall, in the left ventricle, right ventricle, uh, and he was diagnosed with sarcoidosis. Um, another example, um, and again, this is from uh, an electrophysiologist sort of point of view, 57-year-old female with syncope, presents with syncope. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to review this EKG. But uh, you can see that uh, there is right bundle branch block. There is left axis deviation consistent with left anterior fascicular block, so she has bifascicular block. You can see that TR interval is prolonged, so there is possible trifascicular block. So, um, she was also noted to have transient complete heart block and she received a permanent pacemaker. Just to go further uh, in her history, a year and a half later, she had complete heart block. She was 100% uh, paced in the right ventricle and her left ventricular ejection fraction was now down to 21%. She underwent coronary angiogram, which was normal. So she was referred for a upgrade to a biventricular device. Uh, the thought was that maybe her cardiomyopathy is related to RV pacing. And six months later, um, she had two ICD shocks for ventricular fibrillation, and at this time, ejection fraction was 15%. Her FDG PET uh, showed extensive uh, uptake uh, and uh, mediastinal and hilar lymphadenopathy, and extensive patchy left ventricular and right ventricular uptake. So she underwent biopsy uh, of the lymph nodes in the mediastinum, and um, she had uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. I mean, she had sarcoidosis diagnosed and a highly probable uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. She was treated with suppressants and optimal medical therapy for her cardiomyopathy. And now, eight, eight years later, uh, her ejection fraction has improved to 29%, um, and she has been stable and without ventricular arrhythmias. So the other aspect of diagnosis is finding cardiac involvement in patients who have extra cardiac sarcoidosis that is known. Um, so any patient with sarcoidosis anywhere uh, should be screened uh, for symptoms every visit. Um, and we should ask about palpitations, syncope, and dyspnea. That's not explained by their lung involvement or out of proportion. Uh, electrocardiogram, yearly at least, it's an easy thing to do, looking for any abnormality. And I say any abnormality, even though initially I was thinking, well, if they have heart block or bundle branch block, I'll show you an example. T wave inversions, any abnormality should prompt uh, some uh, you know, suspicion. A halter, um, I recommend once a year, once every couple of years, particularly if they have symptoms, but even if they don't, looking for ventricular tachycardia, any AV block. PVCs, uh, say if they have more frequent than expected, or if there are morphologies that uh, are really not expected. Now, it's tough with the zeo patch that we have now, which is just single lead. It's tough to really tell what morphology the PVC has. Uh, but we used to have the three lead, uh, and you could tell, well, is alpha track PVC likely, or this is kind of, this PVC is not likely to be alpha track. And echocardiograms, it's an easy, non-invasive, cheap test without radiation. Uh, so I think it should be done initially, and then it's unclear how often, but uh, maybe once every two, three years, in the every year in the beginning, then spaced out every two, three years, and maybe less often later. 
any abnormality should prompt a further evaluation, including probably MRI or FDG PET. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> After we have a multi we had multidisciplinary conference, um, I had this patient referred by an ophthalmologist. The patient uh, he was treating a patient, a young, healthy patient, asymptomatic, with stable sarcoid uveitis. Uh, and did a screening ECG, which was read as abnormal. When I first saw the preliminary report of the ECG, the computer report, the non-specific T-wave changes, I said, oh my God, uh, this is gonna be low yield. But then when I saw the electrocardiogram, yeah, the patient has some T-wave inversions inferiorly. Um, her echocardiogram uh, showed normal ejection fraction, but there was severe hypokinesis of the infralateral wall. And then cardiac MRI confirmed wall thinning and severe hypokinesis in the mid and apical infralateral wall. Uh, and on the MRI, her ejection fraction was read as 42%. A monitor showed that she did have uh, 5,000 PVCs in 48 hours, so 2.5% burden or so. And these PVCs are uh, right bundle, superior axis, corresponding to the T wave inversions and uh, abnormalities seen on MRI and echocardiogram. And uh, let's move on to another example. 42-year-old male sees his doctor for screening because his mother has congestive heart failure and his ejection fraction turns out to be mildly increased, 40 to 45% on echocardiogram. And the MRI does show patchy delayed enhancement in the septum and anterolateral wall. An FDG PET scan uh, shows increased uh, uptake. And this is his increased uptake, where he has increased uptake in the basal and mid septum and also in the lateral wall. And uh, you might think uh, he has cardiac sarcoidosis, right? Uh, but keep in mind that this is an isolated cardiac uptake, so isolated cardiac involvement. So it's tough because we can't make diagnosis with biopsy, or oftentimes biopsies are negative, even if you target low voltage uh, because the substrate, the, the inflammation is not endocardial. And it turns out that he has a pathogenic desmal packing mutation uh, seen by our, diagnosed by our colleagues in cardiology. And he actually has a familial arrhythmogenic ventricular uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. And um, so uh, there is this paper published in 2019. They looked at 16 patients with definitely ARVC. Seven of them had positive FDG PET scans. Two turned out to have cardiac sarcoidosis on endomyocardial biopsy. So there is clearly a two way street of uh, confusion between ARVC and cardiac sarcoidosis. But of the remaining five, two carried pathogenic desmal plaque mutations. So not all positive PET scans represent cardiac sarcoidosis. You can have genetic cardiomyopathies where areas of necrosis triggering are triggering local inflammation and uh, turn a PET scan positive. You can have other myocarditis, uh, such as viral, lymphocytic, giant cell. And uh, of note, recent ablation, and even not so recent ablation, can cause a positive PET scan. Let me show you some interesting examples here. This is a patient who underwent radiofrequency ablation in the right atrium. Uh, he had a lot of scar in the right atrium and arrhythmias. He uh, underwent extensive ablation in the right atrium on November 29, 2019. This is the PET scan on March 5th, he still has intense patchy uptake in multiple areas in the right atrium. This was called by the radiologist initially possibly uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. Of course, we knew that he had extensive ablation there. So we said, hold off treatment, obviously, and repeat the PET scan later. And we repeated the PET scan nine months after his ablation. There is still some patchy mild increase in uptake, but it's all the, it was read as almost completely resolved. But it's remarkable that nine months after ablation, you can st still see some increased uptake. I think that's very important. Um, so how long do PET abnormalities persist after ablation? Uh, this is another example. The, this patient had ventricular tachycardia and a mild cardiomyopathy and normal coronary arteries. This, he had some VT ablation in the basal septum uh, on August 24, 2018. He had 44 RF lesions. And this is his PET scan a week later or 10 days later. Uh, of course, the floor people, when they got the results, they said, oh, he has cardiac sarcoidosis. No, wait a minute, we just ablated right there. 
And we said, well, let's repeat several months later because we really didn't know for sure what the patient had at this stage. And we wanted to show that things improved. He did have a cardiac MRI as well that showed that endocardium demonstrated multiple areas of focal signal loss, which is what you expect after a recent ablation. And uh, this is a repeat PET scan uh, at the end of February, uh, five months after his ablation. And there is still some increased uptake, which is nearly completely resolved, but still there. So many months later, you still see increased PET uptake. And I'm, uh, the, this patient turned out to have lamin mutation and numeral, numerous VT morphologies and endocardial ablation was not you know, gonna ever succeed. Um, so there's a possible overdiagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis. You can, if the patient is misdiagnosed, he's gonna end up on immunosuppression, which is quite a severe uh, treatment when the patient doesn't need immunosuppression. So for, for example, I saw a patient who had papillary PVCs and a mild cardiomyopathy, and he had a PET scan and MRI soon after an ablation, and it was, they were all positive. Uh, and he was treated with methotrexate, prednisone initially and methotrexate for nearly a year before he presented for second opinion. And because we knew that his PET scan was spotted soon after ablation, we said, well, let's repeat. And then we took him off methotrexate for several months and we repeated a PET scan. There was no activity anywhere. And so we ruled out sarcoidosis and he's just being treated for his uh, disease. Uh, and just wanted to point out that there was a study published in 2015 in the Heart Rhythm Journal where at uh, uh, UCLA, I believe, or Cedar sinai they did 103 PET scans in patients with unexplained non-ischemic cardiomyopathy referred for ventricular arrhythmias, uh, including ventricular tachycardia and PVCs. And half of those PET, PET scans were positive for in, uh, for increased FDG uptake. And that was quite surprising for everyone. And out of those patients, so 50 patients or so were positive, 18 patients were diagnosed with sarcoidosis. But uh, systemic inflammation and lymph node uptake was observed in 17 patients, but isolated cardiac involvement was seen in 33 patients that had positive PET scans. And that's, uh, it raises questions, you know, I mean, is it truly sarcoidosis? Could be other inflammatory cardiomyopathies, could be genetic cardiomyopathies as we discussed, uh, because usually with sarcoidosis, you don't see isolated cardiac involvement. And just wanted to point out that we do not, in this paper, we do not have a history of how many patients had ablation within the previous three, six, nine, 12 months. So I suspect a lot of those, in fact, had positive PET scans because it had been ablated. And looking further at the paper, I find that five patients had catheter ablation performed at an outside hospital, which is a common scenario. We see patients come here referred for ventricular uh, VT ablation. Uh, the local electrophysiologist attempted a, a, a VT ablation as well. So if you do a PET scan, of course, it's gonna turn out positive. And one patient had ablation at the, the institution where the study was reported prior to the abnormal PET scan. So yeah, a lot of these patients might have had uh, either other cardiomyopathies, not sarcoidosis, or just uh, spuriously positive PET scans because of uh, uh, prior ablation. Uh, at, uh, we're part of the cardiac sarcoidosis uh, uh, registry, and uh, uh, an abstract in 2015 from that registry, uh, we found that 12% of patients had isolated cardiac sarcoidosis. And these are patients that have met other criteria uh, for sarcoidosis, including biopsy. But I wonder if some of, uh, some of these uh, actually do not have cardiac sarcoidosis. They could have, um, you know, as we discussed, other cardiomyopathies or just spuriously positive PET scans. So 12% may be an, an, an overestimate. End of note, even if a PET scan only lights up in the heart, if they have some light lymphadenopathy, or even if they don't, you don't see lymphadenopathy on a CAT scan in the hyla and mediastinum, transbronchial biopsy and lavage is oftentimes positive, so it's worth doing. Next, after you make the diagnosis, then you wonder how do you, what do you do for these patients? So a question that first comes up and comes up often is, which patients could benefit from a defibrillator? Uh, 
Well, clearly, if they have cardiac arrest or sustained ventricular arrhythmia, it's in all the guidelines. If they have inducible sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, if they have unexplained syncope that's felt to be arrhythmic, so you don't hear that they have vagal symptoms or other situational uh, trigger. Looking at the ventricular ejection fraction, that might help us. We'll talk about that a little more. Extent of ventricular involvement on MRI, and there are some papers suggesting that some people say if you have any uh, evidence of uh, delay in enhancement on MRI or uptake on PET scan, you may consider a defibrillator. Um, if you want to be more nuanced, if you have MRI involvement of more than 6% of the myocardium, those patients may benefit more from, uh, from uh, the defibrillator. Presence of heart block, because these patients need pacemakers. So once you decide you, they need a device anyway, we should probably have a low threshold uh, for the defibrillator. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, the role of uh, programmed electrical stimulation in risk stratification. This is based mainly on this one study uh, published in 2011 from Mount Sinai in New York. Um, 76 patients with biopsy proven sarcoidosis, but without cardiac symptoms. So they had no symptoms and they had evidence of cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, patients with prior defibrillator or ventricular arrhythmia were excluded. So if they have non sustained VT, they were excluded. So they underwent EP study for risk stratification and they did the tr traditional protocol with uh, singles, doubles, and triples from two sites at two basic drive cycle lengths on and off isoproternal. Eight patients had inducible sustained ventricular tachycardia and they received defibrillators. And this was the event-free survival. Uh, <clears throat> if uh, the EP study was negative, the incidence of events was very, very low. If the EP study was positive, incidence of events was high. If you look at the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, it was tended to be decreased in patients with positive EP study and tended to be normal in patients with negative EP study. So this raises a question whether, well, uh, is the EP study worth it or is the ejection, knowing the ejection fraction is normal, good enough? This is another study actually published in 2019. Uh, EP studies in 69 patients with probable cardiac sarcoidosis, meaning uh, the biopsy was done elsewhere, not in the heart, but there's evidence of heart involvement. So they excluded the patients with any heart block, VTVF or LV dysfunction. So these were patients with normal EF and no uh, uh, VTVF or LV block. Um, and if the EP study was negative, it was highly predictive of a uh, good outcome. Uh, and if the EP study was positive for inducible VT or VF, uh, they had a high incidence of events. So it seems to be useful as a risk stratifier. Um, so let me get back to uh, um, the example of this 36-year-old male that I showed you earlier who presented with palpitations that had uh, PVCs and Q waves and inferior wall infiltrates and non-sustained VT. Um, so we treated them. Um, let me skip over this. We did an EP study and it was negative for sustained VT, uh, although he did have non-sustained VT, so uh, we gave him a defibrillator. He was treated <clears throat> with prednisone uh, and underwent uh, initial high dose prednisone of uh, 40 or 60 milligrams, I can remember. And then he underwent a very slow taper uh, all the way to uh, October 2012, so more than, uh, so 19 months uh, were, yeah, uh, 20 months actually. And uh, he was asymptomatic, he was competing in triathlons and he returns in September 2013 after a lapse in follow-up of a year. He becomes tired more easily, although he is still training for triathlons. And his ICP interrogation shows that he has some events like this, 10 seconds of ventricular ventricular fibrillation with aborted ICD shock. Uh, and we also noted that R waves uh, uh, were decreased in amplitude. Um, the R waves had been stable at 12 until February 2013. His ICD was placed in 2010. And so why would all of a sudden R waves decide to drop um, two or three years later? Um, so this is one example of events like this 
should prompt you to think maybe the sarcoidosis is reactivating. His repeat echocardiogram shows that EF is now 15%, unfortunately. So this is a young man who's competing in triathlons and just minimally tired. Uh, and uh, FDG PET shows extensive ventricular myocardial uptake. So, uh, and this is what uh, his MRI looks like now and his PET scan. He has extensive infiltrates all over his left ventricle and right ventricle, all uh, portending a poor prognosis. So uh, that leads me to an abstract that we published, sent to HRS in 2016. We looked at 60 patients with diagnosed here with cardiac sarcoidosis, and we saw that 37% uh, presented as initial manifestation, uh, cardiac manifestation was symptomatic heart block. And their average EF was normal, uh, low normal, 49%. And after looking at these patients presenting with initial heart block and nearly normal EF, we followed them up for uh, four years. Eight patients, 36%, developed subsequent ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And among these patients who developed ventricular arrhythmias, baseline of ventricular church infraction was on average 39%. Uh, and ultimately, uh, initially, at baseline 39%, but they improved with treatment to over 50%. So a large percentage of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis that presented with heart block Develop subsequent ventricular uh, tachycardia or fibrillation despite a preserved ejection fraction. So uh, we conclude that a lot of these patients that need a pacemaker, we should really think hard about giving a defibrillator initially. So cardiac sarcoidosis is dynamic and unpredictable. So I would keep a relatively lower threshold for recommending a defibrillator. And close surveillance for response to therapy and monitoring for reactivation is necessary. Um, so let me uh, t tell you about this paper uh, about the efficacy and safety of implantable cardia uh, cardiac defibrillators for treatment of ventricular arrhythmias in cardiac sarcoidosis, published in 2013. So they looked at uh, 235 patients followed up for about four years, and 36% received appropriate ICD therapies, and 30% of patients received an appropriate shock. The rest of them received anti-tachycardia pacing only. Um, anyway, just wanted to point out that uh, patients who received appropriate therapies had slightly lower ejection fraction. However, notice that the confidence interval is quite broad. So a normal ejection fraction doesn't mean uh, you're spared. And so uh, these patients have a high incidence of appropriate shocks. Oh, I also wanted to point out that they're relatively uh, young, uh, 54 and 56 average age. So this is a set of relatively young patients with relatively preserved ejection fraction. Compare that in your mind with patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or ischemic cardiomyopathy, all those patients uh, we keep the fibrillators uh, when their ejection fraction is less than 35%. And despite being younger and having better ejection fraction, they get more appropriate shocks. They're, this is a more arrhythmogenic condition than uh, what we're used to. So again, who needs an ICD? Well, what I can tell you is an ICD is not indicated if all of the, uh, these are true. Patient has no syncope, normal left ventricle and right ventricle, no or minimal delayed enhancement on MRI, and no or minimal activity on the PET scan. EP study is negative, there is no indication for pacing, and you know the patient will be closely monitored for disease progression. Everyone else, you should really think about it. And so factors to consider, again, syncope without other explanation, that could be arrhythmic, presence of VP or VF, AV block, need for a pacemaker. Left ventricular ejection fraction, if it's less than 35%, yes, everyone's agreed in agreement. And this is mostly by extrapolation, really. Uh, from other uh, cardiomyopathies. But I would really look into it if the EF is in, decreased at all, 35 to 50%. If the ejection fraction is normal um, or mildly decreased, you may want to do an EP study. We look at the extent of the disease on MRI and the PET scan. Uh, we look at, uh, we do EP study, which is helpful for risk certification and how their compliance with, expected compliance with therapy and follow-up. So 
ICD is not enough. Uh, the, I think the job of the electrophysiologist is not done once you implant ICD. Uh, there are no clinical trials on how to treat uh, sarcoidosis in general, by the way. It's all kind of grandfathered in uh, with immunosuppression. So mainstay of therapy of immunosuppression are corticosteroids. We use steroid sparing agents, methotrexate, and now more recently other agents, including infliximab, TNF inhibitors. Uh, then we can use antiarrhythmic drugs to suppress therapy, uh, to suppress arrhythmias, uh, sotol, amiodarone, maybe mexilatine, and ablation. Um, so let's talk about those a little bit. So in terms of immunosuppression, we looked at outcomes in, our, uh, in a cohort of our patients. And what we did, we did PET-guided immunosuppression. There are other papers, small papers published here and there in the past few years. Um, so in our cohort, each patient had repeated PET, PET scans. And we looked at their outcomes. Uh, we looked at the incidence of sustained ventricular arrhythmia, decrease in the ventricular ejection fraction, heart transplant, or death. And this is an example how to treat these patients. Uh, you know, this patient had uh, intense uptake in the septum, lateral wall basal, uh, maybe in the right ventricle, uh, was put on prednisone, uh, 60 milligrams daily. Some studies suggest 40 milligrams daily may be enough. But then he underwent a slow taper. Uh, five months later, he had repeat PET scan on this dose. It turned out that he still had persistent uptake uh, methotrexate was increased. Um, five more months later, everything was suppressed. Uh, so he did well. So then he underwent slow taper of these. And uh, uh, 10 months later, he has, still has no FDG uh, uptake and he's on maintenance doses of uh, prednisone and methotrexate. And with this approach, this is retrospective obviously, but with this approach, we found that uh, if complete PET suppression was achieved, outcomes were better uh, in terms of death or heart transplant, in terms of uh, the combined outcome of ventricular arrhythmia, death or heart transplant, and just the ventricular arrhythmias themselves. So everything was improved with this strategy of uh, PET-guided uh, immunosuppression. Um, what's the role of antiarrhythmics? Well, uh, in our cohort, arrhythmia-free course correlated with the ability to suppress inflammation. Uh, now, PET-guided immunosuppression is not uh, something without any cost or side effects. There is quite a bit of radiation. This is a very expensive study. How often do you repeat these PETs? How much radiation do you expose the patients to? Clearly, we, we have no prospective trial. Uh, and just wanted to uh, reiterate that uh, this is a cohort of patient, uh, category of patients with uh, highly arrhythmogenic substrate. So whenever we implant a defibrillator, we should also think of uh, if they have any ventricular arrhythmia uh, treated with antiarrhythmics. But then what is the role of VT ablation? So what are the mechanisms of ventricular arrhythmias in cardiac sarcoidosis? Well, you have uh, acute myocardial inflammation, uh, which may result in abnormal increased automaticity or triggered activity, like in, you see in acute myocarditis. Uh, so you have active stages of inflammation early on or during reactivation. So you can have a combination of scar and active inflammation. Corticosteroids have been shown in small uh, cohorts uh, that they reduce arrhythmia burden. Another substrate for uh, ventricular arrhythmias is uh, when you have scar-related reentry, and that's usually seen in more advanced stages. I guess it's possible to happen also if you have dense inflammation uh, with active disease. I would say you can kind of form an idea what type of arrhythmia you're dealing with, because if you see with acute inflammation and increased automaticity, you may see irregular ventricular rhythms, you can see repetitive bursts, and you see pleomorphic or polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia. Whereas with scar, fixed scar-based reentry, you see a regular sustained monomorphic ventricular arrhythmia. And kind of, that kind of guides your treatment. In addition, you, can, you, you get a FDG PET scan, you see if there is active uh, uptake, and that again guides your treatment. 
so what's the role of ablation in cardiac sarcoidosis for ventricular tachycardia? We only have a few series, small numbers of patients. Uh, of these patients, a lot present with incessant VT or VF stor a VT storm. Uh, in those series that were published, most uh, arrhythmias are scar-related uh, monomorphic VT. But there are reports of Purkinje fiber-related bundle branch reentry, micro reentry, and non-reentrant Purkinje focus. These are some of the small series that have been published in years, uh, in the last 15 years or so. Um, but I'm just going to move on. There is a paper that's been submitted for publication from the Cardiac Sarcoidosis Consortium uh, this month. Um, and from this multi-center registry, international registry, uh, we found 158 patients with a mean age of 52 uh, with the, that underwent VT ablation. Median time from cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosis to the ventricular ablation was 827 days. So it tells you these are, I think, uh, selected patients that are, tend to be more late stage. Uh, they're not patients that have been just diagnosed with, uh, with cardiac sarcoidosis. So let's see what uh, these patients are like. Well, they're relatively young and uh, they're relatively preserved ejection fraction. Uh, average median ejection fraction was 45%. Uh, so half of them had an ejection fraction of less than 50%, meaning the other half had normal ejection fraction. Out of these patients, notice 15% presented with resuscitated cardiac arrest or had a history of, a third of them had syncope, uh, almost all of them had defibrillator, a quarter had complete heart block. 40% of these patients that underwent a VT ablation uh, had history of VT, VF storm, or incessant VT. And a tenth of them had polymorphic VT or VF. So it's a different, uh, different uh, presentation than you see in ischemic heart myopathy, for instance. And uh, half of them, at least half of them, had failed uh, treatment with antiarrhythmic immun immunosuppression and a quarter of them had prior VT ablation, and half of them were an amiodarone. And just wanted to point out that uh, the median duration of uh, their VT ablation was six hours. Tells you something about the degree of complexity of this uh, substrate. I thought the procedural complications were interesting. interesting. They're occurring 7% of the patients. Uh, tamponade in five, hematoma one, coronary injury with stenting in one, pneumothorax after epicardial access, cardiogenic shock, and bacterial, one instance of bacterial pericardial that is after epicardial access. So this was the incidence of VT recurrence. Uh, and you see there's a qu quite high rate of recurrence uh, at two and a half years. Interestingly, if you count the ICD shocks the patients received in a month prior to ablation and the month after ablation, there was a de significant decrease. And if you look at uh, what predicted recurrence of VT or heart transplant or death, EF less than 50%, those patients had worse outcomes. And presence of inflammation on the PET scan, those patients had clearly worse outcomes. But even those without any inflammation had recurrence of VT, heart trans, uh, and death or heart transplant. So in summary, VT storm was eliminated in these patients in 82%, but I would caution that uh, all these patients that also undergo escalation of their antiarrhythmic drug therapy as well as immunosuppression. But we can't uh, eliminate VT storm in 82% of these patients with intensive treatment, including ablation. ICD shocks were significantly reduced. And during the median 2.5 years of follow-up, 50% of patients experienced recurrence of VT or heart transplantation or, or death. So this is a high-risk, poor outcome group of patients. You've got to be really careful with these patients. Monitor them closely. LD dysfunction and inflammation in pre-procedural FDG PET were significantly associated with adverse prognosis. 
So there is a role for ablation which has to be appropriately timed uh, and in conjunction with medical therapy. So approach to ventricular arrhythmias in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis has to be stepwise and tailored to the patient. Implanting a defibrillator, remember these patients have a high likelihood of shocks. 30 of them, 30 percent of them get shocks. So we need to do more, not just implant a defibrillator. Um, think about antiarrhythmic drugs. Amiodarone probably is the mainstay of therapy in these patients. Uh, Sotol as well, especially because they're relatively young, you don't want to keep them on amiodarone long term. However, oftentimes I start with amiodarone to get the best result and maybe a year down the road or whenever their uh, arrhythmia is quiet, we think about transitioning to Sotol. I would watch closely for liver toxicity because a lot of these patients, uh, they, they, they can get liver sarcoid involvement, they can get uh, toxicity from methotrexate, and the combination of all these and amiodarone, uh, they're more likely to get liver problems. Uh, need to assess for inflammation. Uh, if inflammation is present, immunosuppression is the mainstay of therapy and antiarrhythmic drug, and go to ablation only if necessary. Uh, if the inflammation is not present, antiarrhythmic drugs and ablation. So see, I put ablation here in parentheses. It's more of an adjunct or if you need to. Initial series reported, oh, uh, monomorph EVT, high success rate, but I think those were patients with end-stage sarcoidosis and we may see fewer of those these days. Uh, so the role of ablation, clearly if they present with VT storm, uh, if they have multiple episodes of VT that's refractory to antiarrhythmic drugs, if they have multiple ICD shocks, if possible, try to buy some time, try to allow time for immunosuppression to work if inflammation is present. And then, of course, you look for potential target, targets. You can have a focal VT, you can have focal PVC triggers, uh, and if you ablate the PVC, uh, the patient then can you know, respond to therapy and everything, uh, you know, uh, they don't have a uh, recurrent VT or VF. You can address if they have a circuit, protected isthmus, exit site, obviously mapped substrate. Uh, always remember to check for bundle branch or fascicular reentry because a lot of these patients do have bundle branch blocks and they have the substrate for bundle branch reentry and they have the septal infiltrates inflammation. And if you do, map the substrate, get MRI, see where the scar is located, uh, consider epi combined epicardial and endocardial approach. And it, a lot of them have septal, septal uh, substrates, so considered bipolar RF or visceral radiation or sympathetomy. Thank you. So let me know if you have any questions. Well, that was great, Alex. Thanks so much. Um, maybe I could just ask you a couple things. You know, I think we see a lot of patients who might have been treated elsewhere, and then maybe our index of suspicion is higher, so we end up diagnosing sarcoid that hasn't been diagnosed for a while. So I guess for the trainees, maybe you could reiterate or just tell them where their index of suspicion should be highest, what types of cases they should be thinking about this diagnosis in. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question. I think um, it's being diagnosed a lot more these days with the readily, readily available uh, scan, uh, MRI, you know, and PET scanning. Um, and um, let me go back to my slides of uh, when should we think about it. Uh, anytime a patient presents with complete heart block, I'm wondering why is this patient having heart block? Uh, sure, you know, patient 82 year old or uh, you think maybe age, right? So you don't think uh, sarcoidosis obviously is low on the, on the list. You don't need to do extensive investigation. Uh, the other day, I think we had a 64 year old patient with chronic kidney disease came with complete heart block. Well, she had extensive calcification on the, micro, uh, on the aortic annulus, so no wonder she had heart block. But if you have patients younger than 65 years of age uh, that just show up with heart block, always consider what's causing it and consider doing a cardiac MRI. Uh, or looking just, a lot of them have CAT scans and see, do they have lymphadenopathy? Do they have sinus, uh, other, you know, uh, organ system involvement? Kind of minimal screening in your mind. 
Uh, if a patient shows with ventricular tachycardia, uh, there are some tachycardias for which we don't really bother doing a lot of investigation, say if it's clearly off of track, even, but although even there, you know, if you have a RVC that's not diagnosed, so be careful getting a family history, uh, looking at all the data. Um, but unexplained VT, that's not a clearly benign version, so weird morphology of PVCs or VT, think about the possibility. Um, presence of cardiomyopathy and heart block. I mean, it's not normal or common for uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy to have both. Same as heart block and ventricular arrhythmia. You know, if you have a patient receive a pacemaker and now all of a sudden they have non-sustained VT or brief runs of VF or polymorphic VT, that's just not, uh, you don't expect that in a patient with just the isolated heart block. So those are the main instances. Um, you know, if you find infiltrates on the cardiac MRI done for another reason, say, uh, then you have to start investigating and see where there are delayed, where, where is there a delayed enhancement? Is it inflammatory? Is there mediastinal lymphadenopathy? Are other organs involved? Can we biopsy it? Um, cardiac biopsy, you know, low yield in our experience. We even tried to go voltage guided, LV biopsy, RV biopsy, low yield. So, but extra cardiac biopsy, high yield, especially bronchoscopy. Yeah, that was, I was going to ask you about endomyocardial biopsy. So I'm glad you addressed that. And then, you know, you've done a lot of work, as you mentioned, this is kind of a multidisciplinary um, disease. And you've done a lot of work with pulmonary and optho and all these other folks who are involved in care. Can you talk about a little bit of all the screening that our patients get uh, once they get a diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid? Uh, sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, give me a second here. Yeah, so we do screen, uh, they screen for symptoms, cardiac symptoms every visit. And uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, do EKG every visit or at least once a year. And uh, some of them do uh, initial 48 hour ultra monitor and uh, then an echocardiogram. I think every patient with any extra cardiac sarcoidosis should get an initial uh, a baseline uh, can you see this? Is this on your screen? Yep. Uh, should have uh, initial echocardiogram at baseline. And then the question is how often do you repeat? Um, and maybe you repeat in one year and then just space it out, I would say, and uh, just do it based on symptoms. Um, so that's what they do. 